Mom made that. I hope you can give me a favor at the church and get out of my bag. In some ways it seems strange for me to welcome you since you're the members of this congregation and I'm just a renter from downstairs. Uh oh no you're not. Uh, we don't say that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a renter from downstairs. <laughs> but I welcome you to worship on, uh, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome you to this place where we gather on each Lord's Day to offer our prayers and our our praises uh, to attend to the word and to offer ourselves uh, that God's will may be done in this world. There, are, I'm sure there are announcements. Um, I don't know what they are, <laughs> but they're here. Let's see. There's a bike to school ride. Uh, the bulletin here from uh, and um, a uh, school supply drive, and there are other. Um, announcements here that I'm sure you can uh, can look out for and here comes someone who's going to <laughs> someone who knows <laughs> yes sir <laughs> um, <clears throat> the sign up sheet for the uh, Shawnee Theater Melodrama which is this Thursday evening is downstairs in Fellowship Hall um, <clears throat> uh, if you would like to go sign up today then tomorrow we're going to make the decision whether we um, are going to go or not if we have enough people signed up. Um, uh, Judy Irison and Lou Malcolm have gone through the kitchen and there's about 15 serving platters, cooking utensils, all kinds of stuff that don't belong to the church. They belong to members of the church. So they're on a display downstairs. Go downstairs during fellowship hour and take your stuff home, please. And um, I was going to say I can't read my own hand handwriting, but I don't <laughs> uh, We uh, still need people to sign up for liturgists. We've been very happy with how many of you have volunteered to be liturgists over the next three months. And I'll have that uh, liturgist sign-up sheet um, downstairs. Just come and see me. All right. Thank you, Alan. And as we prepare to gather our selves and our minds and our hearts together. Let us take a few moments of silence before we listen to the prayer and continue our worship.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Bless to us, O God, this day fresh made. In the chorus of birds, bless us. In the scent of blossoms, bless us. In the wet grass and the spring flowers, bless us. Bless us and heal us. For we come to you in love and trust. We come to you in expectant hope. God of all mornings and all beginnings. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand to your label and sing hymn number 469, Morning has Broken. <coughs>
Okay, did you hear that? Yeah. What? I did. That's what forced him to call, but it took quite a while to Well, I see two children. Any others who'd like to come up? Well. So, well, hi. I've never met you all before. I'm <laughs> see you all quite a bit. It's good to see you. Uh, this is a picture in my office. Now you've been in, you've been in my office before. Have you seen you've never been in my office? Okay. Well, <laughs> you're very nearby. Um, so do you know who this is? Does that seem right to you? Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. Any idea why I might like it a lot? Yes. Because he's smiling. <laughs> Oh, here, the camera. Oh, cute. I could take the thumbs up, I guess not. <laughs> there we go. Yes, it's one of my favorite pictures of Jesus. And the, the name of this picture is called The Risen Christ by the Sea. So it's, it's like that. There's one of them laughing. There is, isn't there? Just his head Throwing his head back, laughing. That's a great picture, too. So, um, I like this picture of Jesus because he is smiling, and um, he's yeah, like a yeah. But I bet he's see. I think he's fun a lot. I there are a lot of things to be worried about, and there are a lot of things to be sad about, and there are some things that are worth being mad about. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And all those feelings are 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 right. They're, they're right. They're, They've got their place. But there are a lot of things to smile about. And there are a lot of things to be happy about. And this picture um, is of a Jesus after his resurrection. So this is after he suffered and after he died. And he uh, is back and alive. And I think here he's smiling to let us know that things are going to turn out all right. And there's going to be a lot of laughter and a lot of smiles. And even in hard times, maybe we can stop sometimes and think about those things that are good and that do make us smile. Like the fact that we have each other. And the fact that we have a church family. And the fact that we've got our own family. There's lots of reasons to smile. And um, so I just want to show this to you and I want to show it to you and uh, um, to remember that I think this is how Jesus wants us to remember him. And just as there are lots of reasons for us to smile, we can do a lot to help others smile too. When people are having a hard time, we can help them and, and help them smile and feel a little bit better, a little bit easier. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your smiles and for your laughter. We know that there are many times when your life on earth was difficult and painful and even scary. We also know that you knew always that in the end it would not be that way. That in the end there would be smiles and laughter. And so we thank you for that. And we thank you that we have reasons to smile and laugh. And we ask that we can help others find reasons to smile and laugh as well. In your name we pray. Amen. So I think you all have got a song. Is that right? Yeah, <clears throat>
join me in the prayer of confession. In penitence and faith, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Gracious and holy God, God whose, whose mercy comes fresh, fresh every morning, morning we, we confess to you our faithlessness, our, our lack of trust, trust in your promises, our, our lack of hope in your reign. reign. Forgive, Forgive us our sins and free us from, us from our fears that we may serve you with joy and confidence, offering ourselves as instruments of your providing love. In the strong name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now the assurance of pardon. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We now begin our uh, scripture reading. Uh, the first reading is Romans 8, 26-28. Um, your free Bible, that's on page 862 in the wide screen. It's uh, page 1741. And in honor of Mitch, uh, may you hear a word of hope for your lives. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he searches our hearts, knows the minds of the Spirit, because the God intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Before I read the gospel lesson and set about the preaching, I just want to say a few things on behalf of the Presbytery about this process of finding a pastor. It's been a long time since this congregation has, uh, has, has found um, an installed pastor. So uh, first of all, I want to say that the pastor nominating committee it's been one of the hardest working groups I've ever had the privilege of witnessing. <laughs> Absolutely. <Okay>. And um, <laughs> weekly meetings, sometimes more than once a week, uh, numerous emails back and forth, interviews by Skype, um, bringing candidates in to, uh, for face-to-face -face visits, which takes an incredible amount of time on behalf of the committee, offering hospitality, following up on those visits, uh, talking with each other, discerning the will of God in this situation. And they've done an incredible job. And I have met this person uh, that they have invited to come here, and I am uh, pleased to, to, to know this person. I, I did not know this person until um, uh, the, this process began, but I'm really pleased with, personally pleased with the choice and with my sense of the goodness of fit between this person and the congregation. In the end, though, that's a decision that you'll be part of making. The, um, uh, what the pastor nominating committee has actually done is, is not so much issue the call, but invite this person to candidate for the call because it really is your decision as a congregation. In the Presbyterian Church, the congregation is the body that votes whether or not to call a person to be an installed pastor. So this person will come, and you'll have a chance to meet this person and um, uh, get to know this person. You'll hear this person preach, and then following that service on August 21st, <coughs> Your moderator, who is currently Hannah Elliott, will uh, call the meeting of the congregation <coughs> to order, and she will ask the uh, PNC to make its presentation. They'll tell you more about this person, why they believe this is a good fit, and uh, they'll be available to answer questions. You will have in front of you uh, a, uh, a sheet with the terms of call, with the, uh, the salary, the housing, and all the benefits that have been negotiated. 
and um, prior to this presentation, this person will leave the room and you will vote by ballot, yes or no. And if um, an 85% majority of you vote yes, then this person will be asked if he or she is, is willing to accept. And, um, and then if all of that happens, and, and we're hopeful that it will, then the uh, Committee on Ministry has already authorized the beginning of this relationship and will, as Andy said, then proceed to make plans to install this person. So uh, there are several more steps yet to come. Uh, they are, as we say in the Presbyterian Church, decently and in order. <laughs> and um, uh, I, uh, I believe you'll be uh, favorably uh, impressed with the good work of the pastor nominating committee and with this person that they believe that God is calling to be your next pastor. So, um, yes, sir. So if the vote is okay, when will that new person come in? Um, that will uh, be announced. I, I, I know this person wants to give uh, around 60 days notice to the current church. And so it'll be a, 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 a around a couple of months after. And that will give you time to prepare for the arrival and there's some things that you can do to, to uh, make this person's entry here uh, um, uh, joyous and uh, to get ready for that. So between now and when that person is here, Hannah Elliott will be the moderator for session and will moderate any congregational meetings. And, and I'm just downstairs too. So um, I, again, I'm very impressed with the work of the past nominating committee. It has uh, it's, it's been um, hard work. It's had its, um, its ups and its downs, as it does in every situation. But uh, there's never been a loss of, of faith or trust or hope. And um, uh, it, the work really, really has paid off. So I just wanted to say those, those few things. Um, <clears throat> and now, um, what was that that, that Mitch used to say? Uh, what a word of hope for your souls. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, may you for hear a word of hope for your life. I think is what okay. you can say. Well, hey, here's another you? word of hope for your life <laughs> yeah. from the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, "Lord, teach us to pray," as John taught his disciples. He said to them, "When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name." Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me, the door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Who knew what the disciples were thinking when they heard Jesus call to him, to them and say, come, follow me. But they did it. They did it. They left their nets and their homes and their old way of living and followed an itinerant preacher from Nazareth. Perhaps they saw in Jesus an answer to a lifelong quest, a sense, a, a feeling, an awareness of home that they had never encountered before, yet one that was so familiar they knew it immediately. Like the man in the parable of the pearl of great price, they were willing to sell everything they had to keep hold of it. 
Perhaps they found in Jesus an awareness of home that was far beyond their ability to provide for themselves, something far beyond their own worries and preoccupations and ambitions and attachments. A home, as the Apostle Paul says, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. Who was this Jesus who called to them, whose simple words, come follow me, changed their lives forever? The Gospel story tells us how they came to know this Jesus and how often they misunderstood and, and got lost along the way. But it also tells us how they began to learn and to trust and to give themselves over and over and over again to the one who held nothing back. All in good time, the disciples' relationship with Jesus unfolds and they begin to see what it is in him that quickened their hearts and their steps when they first met him. They began to see a man fully present and clear in his sense of purpose. Someone not plagued with the anxieties they faced. Someone not afraid to speak the truth, not afraid to challenge, not afraid to challenge the oppressive forces around him. Someone who offered freedom, deep, abiding, radical, life-changing freedom to everyone he encountered. They saw how he spent his day preaching, teaching, healing, liberating, proclaiming in word and in deed the good news of the kingdom of God. And they began to see the source of his power, his relationship with God, his life of prayer. They began to see that that was a source of his power. And one day they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. The Gospel of Luke offers more examples of Jesus' practice of prayer than does any other gospel. In Luke's story of the baptism of Jesus, we read how the Spirit came upon him while he was praying. We read how he withdrew to a desolate place to pray, especially when the crowds would gather around him looking for a miracle. We read how he prayed before he called his disciples. We read this, now during those days he went out to the mountain to pray and spent the night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. We read how he prayed prior to Peter's confession that he was the Christ, the son of the living God, and how he prayed before his transfiguration. We read of his impassioned prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, Yet, not my will, but yours be done. And we read of his pleading on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Gospel of Luke tells of a Jesus whose life is marked by prayer. This is the Jesus to whom the disciples turn and to whom the disciples ask, Lord, teach us to pray. By the, by the first century, devout Jews were saying set prayers in the morning and the evening. And John the Baptist had apparently taught his disciples how to pray and had apparently taught his disciples a particular form of prayer. So the disciples see Jesus praying and they ask him to teach him them to do so. And Jesus responds with what we call the Lord's Prayer. Now the version we have in Luke is a little bit different than the one we have in Matthew. Matthew's version of the prayer is more polished, and there are seven petitions as opposed to the five petitions in Luke. Neither verse contains the closing benediction that we know for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Yet we find similar words in 1 Chronicles. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And so this prayer is very scriptural. And of course, there are different versions of the prayer among Christians today. We say debts, others say trespasses, <coughs> others say sins. But regardless of what version of the prayer we use, the Lord's Prayer is central to our faith. For Jesus, prayer was clearly a relationship with God. It was not just something that he did. It was part of the nature of his life. One of my favorite books that I read probably 20 years ago now 
is a book by Father Thomas Keating called Open Mind, Open Heart. And he speaks of prayer as a relationship with God. And he talks about four stages of that relationship. It's been helpful for me to think about prayer and relationship this way. In the early days, Father Keating says, we are in an acquaintanceship. This is a somewhat formal stage in which we are beginning to get to know one another. The time we consciously spend with God is primarily verbal, with us doing most of the talking. Father Keating calls the next stage friendliness. Here we start to spend more time together with God, sharing, talking, thinking. We seek out the scriptures to help us learn more about God, and our prayers may become less formal. In friendship, Keating's third stage, we make a deeper commitment to the relationship. We begin to arrange our schedules so that we can spend more time alone with God, as we would with a friend. We begin to look for times and to make the time. There is a deeper sharing of the inner desires of our hearts, and our prayers include spontaneous, heartfelt moments. And the last stage, Father Keating calls intimacy, a time when we simply want to be with God. Our expectations of, our expectations of this prayer time lessen. We can relax with God, knowing that nothing needs to happen that the purpose of that time is simply to be with God. We become less focused on outcomes, less focused on doing it right. We find ourselves in a deeper union with God, a union that transforms us. The love we share makes a difference in our lives and makes a difference in our other relationships as well. No doubt this was the nature of Jesus' life of prayer one of intimacy with the God who sent him to earth. The disciples see the fruits of this intimacy, and they want to share in it. And so they say, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus does indeed give them words for prayer, but they are not magic words, for he also teaches them about the God to whom we pray. The Lord's Prayer is, um, this, this Lord's Prayer that Jesus teaches is followed by the assurance that God listens to our prayers. In the first teaching, we hear about a man who goes to his neighbor in the middle of the night and asks for some bread so that he can provide hospitality to an unexpected guest. The neighbor might be roused from his sleep, but the psalmist says that he who keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, that God is more trustworthy than even the best neighbor. In the second teaching, Jesus urges us to be bold in prayer, to ask, to seek, to knock. For just as an earthly father knows how to give good gifts, so does the Heavenly Father. Of course, we don't always give our children everything <coughs> they ask for. Some of the things that they ask for might not be good for them. And those of you who have children know that very well. <laughs> And so it is also the case with prayer. We think we know what we want, but we also just might be wrong. Even Jesus knew that he must wait upon God's will. At Gethsemane, he spoke his wishes boldly. Please let this cup pass me by. But he also said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine own be done. It reminds me of a prayer his mama prayed years before on that day when the angel Gabriel visited her and told her that she would be the mother of the Most High. And she said, let it be with me according to thy will. Like mother, like son. Mary knew, Jesus knows. Jesus teaches us that prayer is not a blank check that God will give us whatever we uh, write on that check. In prayer, rather, we open our heart to God. We open ourselves to God, our desires, our yearnings, our wounds and our wonderings, our hopes and our dreams, our fears and our failings. We open our very selves to God and we allow God to do the writing. We allow God to write on our hearts. The disciples ask for a lesson on prayer, and Jesus gives them a lesson on God. 
for Jesus knows that those who will have an honest, trusting relationship with God will also be know we all will also know how to pray truly. The prayer that Jesus taught is not a prayer of magic words. This prayer instead, these words instead, and more important, are the words of a worshiping community, one just like ours. A spoken desire for the fullness of God, for the fullness of God's kingdom on earth, right here, right now, for bread, <clears throat> one day at a time, for forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace to forgive others, for protection from life's temptations, and for a world where evil does not have the last word. These words are prayed to a God from whom all blessings flow, a God whose promises to make all things new come true every day, a God whose mercy and grace and power are beyond measure, a God who set the stars in motion and who causes the leaves to dance in the breeze. God, the creative wisdom behind the entire universe of all that is seen and unseen. And this same God, who is beyond time, beyond space, beyond our own imagining and our own ability to comprehend, this same God desires a relationship with us with every one of you. And God has placed in each of us a yearning that can only be satisfied by giving ourselves over and over and over again to the one who has held nothing back. You have made us for yourself, Augustine prayed, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. No wonder the disciples' steps quickened when they heard Jesus call to them. No wonder their hearts quickened when they heard his voice. When they heard the voice of the one who was indeed one with the God who made heaven and earth. Lord, teach us to pray, they said. And so he did. And so he does still. In word and in deed, the word made flesh opens our hearts and our minds to the possibility and the power of prayer that will quicken our hearts to love the Lord our God and will quicken our steps to love our neighbors as ourselves. <coughs> and we'll be praying it again in a minute, but it won't hurt us to pray it twice today. Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So when we gather on each Lord's Day, we gather again to offer our praises, to attend to the word, and we also gather to give ourselves, to give of ourselves and of our gifts. So I invite you now to uh, offer your tithes and offerings as you offer yourself to the one who has held nothing back. Mm.
in gratitude and ask that you are sixpence none the richer, that you will channel them towards greatest need and to mold us as vessels of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we come together uh, in our prayers of uh, concern and thanksgiving, I have a few to mention. And uh, one, a, a, um, a note uh, to the congregation here from uh, the um, family of uh, Bob and Sue Lormer. The Lormer children would like to express our deep and sincere appreciation for the many ways in which you've shown love to our parents during mother's illness in this year of 2016. Distance and responsibilities keep us from being with them as often as we would like, but we are comforted by the true, by the true friendship and care they receive from you. May God's blessings be multiplied unto you. Linda, Rob, Mick, Anita, Andy, and families. And indeed, I, I'm, I'm certain that your love and care for uh, Bob and Sue lighten the load for their children, and they are grateful. I also uh, want to mention that uh, Sarah Cochran has asked that we keep her in our prayers. She's been feeling a little under the weather, and uh, so we uh, hold her in our prayers. What other prayers shall we offer? Yes, Stephanie. Uh, my dad is having gallbladder surgery this morning. Stephanie's father is having gallbladder surgery. And that was as, uh, as rarely planned. Yeah, I'm not this morning, yeah. so. Um, Sue? Nancy Trulove is also in the hospital. Okay. Nancy Trulove. Yes? For Isla's dad, Kareem. Alejandra's father. Yes? Travel mercies for my son, Alexander. He is traveling to Japan with the Bloomington South Solar Bike Club, and they'll be doing a solar bike race and also traveling the country. Oh, nice. Alexander, so, traveling mercies to you. Yeah. <laughs> Strong legs. Yeah. Are there others? Yes. Uh, Sarah Moon Singh. Uh, she, um, <clears throat> she hasn't had a baby yet, so she's scheduled for um, Induction. She, uh, she's going to be induced, the child will be, yeah. The Late this afternoon. Ah, yes, it's eminent. <laughs> I would pray for Sarah and for this new baby. Some of you may know Mary Jensen, who is a pastor in Bloomington. She's not currently serving a church. Her husband, uh, Ben Kramer, is in uh, final stages of cancer and is at hospice house. So we keep Mary and Ben in our prayers and their family. And we keep our brother Mitch in our prayers as he makes his transition to the next chapter in, in his life. I will get to see him soon. He is teaching transitional ministry education. Um, I'm the team leader this year at Montreat, and I was smart enough to ask him to be on the team. And I'll be glad to see him very soon, and I will send him uh, your best. I saw the chair. Alan showed it to me before um, uh, that before that Sunday. It was just such a beautiful gift for him, as he was such a, a good gift for for you as well. Are there other prayers? I ask your prayers for my mother, Marjorie, who um, is. Uh, 91 soon and um, uh, has been facing cancer and other illnesses and is clearly getting uh, weaker and weaker. I'll be seeing her soon and uh, trust that that will be a good visit. Are there others? Well, of course there are. They're on our minds and in our hearts and they are too deep for words and we offer them with these prayers as we go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you are ours and we are yours. And we come to you as your people have come through the ages. 
naming before you the concerns that we face for the families and, and friends who are in need, whom we have named aloud and whom we hold on our prayer list. And we come to you in prayer for this whole world. The need is so great. And the number of prayers lifted to you beyond count. And you hear them all, and you hold them all, even as you hold us. So hold us now and give us the grace to offer our finest and our best to you. Keep us aware of the needs that may be beyond our knowing, but keep us aware that there are so many needs, so many people around this world who struggle and worry, who hunger and thirst, who suffer in so many ways, victims of violence and oppression around this world and in our own community, maybe in our, on our own streets, on our own, in our own neighborhoods. So as we offer these prayers to you, we also ask that you will help us be the answers to the prayers we pray, that we may reach out and offer help whatever we can. These and so many other prayers we pray to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us the way of prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our final hymn is number 281, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
go on out of here into this world that God loves so much and go as people of God and, and go as people whom God has given to this world. You are God's gifts. And may those who see you know that God indeed is alive. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.